All right, my friends, we are back in Florida at Haven Smart. Yamaha brought their 5000 series components to us. We missed Expona. They wanted us to hear these products. We got my good friend, Phil Shea. Dude, I've known you forever, man. Yeah, over, tw over 20 years, yeah. Decades. That's how old we are, although he looks <laughs> a lot younger than me. Anyways, we want to talk about the NS5000 speakers. That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delisella with Audio Hawks. Phil, it is awesome to have you here. You and Mr. Kumasawa, I feel honored. Our boy Don is here as well. Yeah. This is just good times, good people. I want to talk to you about your speakers. It's been a while since I looked at your speakers. I've always kind of been fascinated with the NS1000s, right? I didn't realize that they've been around since the 70s. You guys were the first to come up with the beryllium drivers back in the 70s when everybody was using paper cones and yeah. wizard cones. That's awesome. That was a legendary product used in studio, still sought out to today. If you go on eBay and you look up an NS1000, those things hold their value. There's some good prices out there for them, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So that product went away, obviously. It was around for decades. Yeah, mid to late 90s, I think, is when we finally finished production on them. And you didn't really come out with a replacement model until now, No, because right? I think since then we've been focusing on home theater speakers, you know, because yeah. we're kind of... Um, more home theater, AV receivers, surround sound, and things like that. And so mm -hmm. our speaker design kind of followed that. Uh, and it was a lot more home theater type speakers uh, rather than pure hi-fi. So we decided when we did the 5000 series, we decided to go back to our hi-fi roots and start from scratch. And well, let me tell you, Phil, the 5000 series electronics that we have here that we did a video on with Mr. Kumasawa-san, incredible craftsmanship, performance, you name it. It's awesome to see now you have a level of speaker that goes with this whole series. So let's talk a little bit about the design philosophy of these speakers. What's inside the box? Because that's what's really a telling story. Yeah, well, uh, okay. You we know got what? props. We got props here. So the, well, let's start with the outside and move in. Okay. So the first thing you'll notice is we got these the beautiful drivers that are on there. It's a material called Xylon. Xylon is a man-made synthetic. Um, it's the strongest synthetic that there is. A one and a half millimeter fiber of Xylon can lift a metric ton. So wow, it like is Superman's it's hair. super strong. So <laughs> that's uh, so it goes into um, aerospace, uh, heat shields and things like that. <laughs> Come on, I'm seeing Superman with the with the hair suspended. Sure like <laughs> so it's um it, it's super strong. So aerospace and of course Anything that's used in aerospace, the Formula One guys mm -hmm. think they need to have it. And so there's a lot of components on Formula One cars that are made out of Xylon. And then the next natural progression would be aerospace, Formula One, and Yamaha speakers. So we developed a method. One thing with using Xylon is normally if you're doing a paper cone or if you're doing carbon fiber, you have your form and your shape. Uh, you lay a sheet over the top, you put glass or epoxy, whatever combination that you do, and then you heat it and press it together, and it comes out a beautiful carbon fiber cone, for instance. Right. Um, this doesn't work that way because it doesn't stretch. Remember that one ton for a millimeter. Mm -hmm. So when you lay it over a form, it doesn't want to form. You know, I can pull it this way, or I can't pull it that way, I can't pull it that way. I can pull it diagonally, but then you start getting wrinkles in it and stuff like that. So Yamaha actually had to develop a method. Um, it's a heat. It's a it's a whole process uh, to actually be able to form these into domes. Now, the reason we chose Xylon is it has almost the same sonic qualities of speed. Uh, speaker material you want it damped. You don't, yeah. you, your speaker you want to you don't want it to ring. Be alive, but you yeah. don't want the material itself. It is extremely close to beryllium uh, in those properties. Um, beryllium we don't use as much anymore. You remember the thousand M's were beryllium. Mm -hmm. We developed the, the method uh, for making those. The problem with beryllium, there, well, there's two things. One is if you eat some beryllium, you die, so it's poisonous. Don't eat your NS1000s. <laughs> Don't eat your tweeters. Um, and number two, it's a super brittle metal. So when you 
shape it and form it, it's extremely brittle. So about as big as we can get with beryllium uh, with our method is about this size right here. So it's a two and a half, three mm -hmm. inches, about as big as a dome as you can get. Now that's fine, so you can have a mid-range and a tweeter, but then you have to go to a different material for the woofer. Yeah. So you don't get that um, sound all the way through all three drivers. Uh, so by using the Xylon, yep. we can have the same material for all three drivers, so we get coherence in the sound as we're as we're going up through the frequencies. Cool. So that's that's why that was chosen, and it, it was a challenge. It was a, a tough thing to do. So let's start with the tweeter. So one thing I noticed about this tweeter is it's not a one inch dome. It's a little bit smaller. It's a three quarter inch dome. And let me just guess why you went with a smaller dome. I'm assuming you did it because it has better dispersion characteristics. It may not play as low, but the fact that you have a dome xylon mid-range that could pick up those frequencies that the lower frequencies of bigger tweeter could do that this one can't gives you better directivity control of the two drivers, right? Exactly. That has a pretty wide uh, frequency spectrum yeah. for, that for more than you'd expect from a, a normal mid-range. So we can go with the smaller one for all the reasons you say. I like that the faceplate itself is like a, a aluminum, yep. like pretty thick aluminum, yep. cast aluminum. So what is this thing on the back? Well, Yamaha is the world's largest manufacturer of musical instruments, so we thought we'd uh, team up with our trombone department because they bend trombone parts and French horns and things like that. Um, so what we want to do is any resonance that's in the driver itself, yeah. we want to cancel out. And one of the ways of doing that is each one of these tubes is tuned at a different frequency. So basically, we're canceling out any resonances that are in the driver and the structure and the, the spider and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, is all done acoustically uh, with this, this patented. Uh, it's basically uh, a very fancy rear chamber. So most yeah. tweeters have a rear chamber on yeah, it. Yeah, and it just, this if you just. a tuned rear chamber. Yeah, if you have just a chamber that sticks out, that chamber has a resonance frequency too. Yeah. So this, the way these are all different lengths, they will cancel everything out and you get a nice consistent back pressure on the tweeter all the time. It's not the resonance. See, it's just, it's just the devil in the details with the 5000 series. We talked about this with the electronics and now you see this. I didn't even realize that these were all different lengths. Yeah. There was a purpose to that. Yeah. Pretty cool, pretty cool. And then we do the same thing with the, with the mid-range driver. So how big is this mid-range, like a two and a half or three? Uh, three and a quarter, something, yeah. Yeah. I can, we can measure it. I believe I it. don't get in the details because it sounds good. I don't yeah, want to mess true. it. <laughs> so basically the same principle here. Same principle, yeah. But it's a lower frequency, so you got bigger wavelengths, so of course the tubes are longer and more volume in them. Very cool. Okay. And that's all isolated from the, you know, and that also isolates it from the cabinet itself. So the uh, woofer's not affecting anything. So speaking of the woofer, why don't we just, this one's a pretty big, this is a good little workout here. So a couple of things I noticed about this woofer, again, yeah. this is the, uh, the same Xylon material with the butyl rubber surround. One thing I noticed that was cool about this guys is not only does it have a vented pole piece in the back of the magnet, but the voice coil itself is vented. And in between, all around here, there's just a lot of airflow and there's dual spiders. This is part of that symmetry that you guys are trying right. to follow through with the 5000 series of electronics. So this really linearizes the forward and backward motion yep. of the driver, it keeps right? Keeps everything in line and going right on through there. So the one thing that I, I don't even think you realize this until <laughs> I was talking to Mr. Kumasawa-san is these little things on the back of the cone. There's a purpose to these. And I'll, sh I'll show you some pictures up close. Yeah. This actually helps linearize the travel of the cone because there's nonlinear uh, movement of the cone. This balances that force out and it cancels out those nonlinearities. That's really interesting. Yeah, because th there's going to be resonances in the cone itself yeah. you know, as it you know, ripples out through the, through the side of the cone. So wherever there's a peak, we can put a little bit of mass right there. All it is is a little extra mass and that lowers the, the frequency of that resonance. Yeah. Uh, so it matches, so everything's in sync. So they're like tuned cones, You're tuned right. woofer cones. So it's paper on this side, and then it has the xylem material the xylem. And formed onto this. That's pretty cool. And this is what, a 12-inch driver? Yeah, 12-inch. Yeah. yeah. And we heard, you know, we were listening to Tin Pan Alley, Steve Ray Vaughn, which has some really good bass notes in it. And the bass was pretty punchy. It was, you know, had good depth to it. And we're not in the, obviously, the most acoustically ideal situation, but yeah. it still had... Very good sound quality to it, for sure. 
Um, yeah, and that Stevie Ray Vaughan cut, we, we use that a lot, even though uh, people have heard it a million times. We're always looking for something different and yeah. exciting, but uh, we use it a lot at the shows because it shows the dynamics uh, and the transient response of these speakers because uh, there's a lot of uh, rim shots throughout yeah. that cut where it's like, you know, fairly quiet, but then all of a sudden there's a snap, you know, which yes. is, you know, goes full speed. You need all three drivers to react at the same time. One of the designs of the 5,000 speakers is there's no batting material in, internal. Um, That's why we have this J pipe. Yeah, right? we'll, we'll get to that. <clears throat> so what happens is um, when the cabinet starts to resonate, and I'll get back to the, the response, uh, the quick response. When the cabinet starts to resonate, let's just say in the vertical, you know, it does it in all three mm -hmm. planes, but the frequency in the vertical, um, what happens is you get the wave up there. So you get high pressure at the top, low at the bottom. And since it's resonating, it's changing sides like that, you know, high and then the high and then the low yeah. is up here. So what we do, and we've done for century, half a century or more, is you cram batting material inside the cabinet. What the batting material does is it slows down the uh, speed of the air. So in open air, what, you know, it's 1120 feet a second, I guess is, is sound mm -hmm. uh, at sea level. When you put batting in there, it will slow the air down as it travels. So that resonance, it gets slowed down. So it might be 900 or 1000 feet per second. Well, that puts it, that starts to shift it out of phase with the cabinet's trying to do this, but the yeah. air can't move fast enough inside. But you can't, it's hard to eliminate. And what happens is when that cabinet's resonating, it is putting back pressure. So it's low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. This woofer might be trying to do 80 hertz, you know, a bass guitar or something like that. Mm -hmm. But let's say the cabinet is resonating at uh, 100 hertz and there's a little 100 hertz element in the music. The cabinet's going to start ringing at the 100 hertz. Uh, this is trying to do 80 hertz, so it's getting pushed and shoved and pushed and shoved. And so that's why a lot of times bass gets muddy sounding and stuff mm -hmm. like that because your amp is trying to control that <clears throat> that back pressure of the resonance. So if we can find out a way to eliminate that back pressure, give us a, a, a homogenous pressure inside the, the wooden cabinet, right. then this is in like a neutral position all the time. And when something comes through, a signal comes through, it can react. It's not fighting against any of the resonances in the cabinet. Also, when you stuff a cabinet with a lot of material, it actually reduces the efficiency of the cabinet yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where this piece comes in. There's actually two of these oh, okay. uh, in there. There's one on each side. Mm -hmm. They're mounted internal. Uh, since they are internal, they're not real pretty. It's basically glorified yeah. cardboard, cardboard that's been yeah. formed. But it's tuned to be out of phase with the resonance of the box. So. In principle, this is what happens. So when the high pressure builds up at the top of the cabinet, the low pressure at the bottom, since this is out of phase with that, it's not scientifically, but this it's easier to visualize. When it's high pressure up here, it's low pressure right here, and it kind of sucks the high pressure and drains it down to the low pressure side. So it adds high pressure to the low pressure side mm -hmm. and reduces that. So the high pressure gets greatly reduced, the low pressure gets increased. So the inside of the box, the pressure is stabilized. So now there's no none of that resonance back pressure inside there. So there's just there's a little bit of batting material around the um, crossover that's, right. that's inside there, but it's not stuffed in there. It's just a couple key places inside the cabinet. So this is a patented, uh, design right here. I've we never seen a speaker that that does this approach, so it's very interesting to me. Well, yeah, yeah I'm, you know, I, I joked about being a you know music instrument company, but this acoustics, we know that we have expertise in all levels of that, yeah. and so designing something like this and coming up with the idea, there's got to be a better way to deal with the resonances in the cabinet, um, and this is what they came up with, and it's it's actually actually being used in newer products right. from the five thousand series. Well, since it's patented, it's ours. We're yeah. using it. In it can, tra other, it can trickle miles. down to other products. So the other cool thing that um, you were talking about here in the transients of the speaker, sometimes that's masked when you have a cabinet that does resonance on yep. its own. Yep. 
when you have a cabinet that's built like this, and I, you know, I was looking at this, I'm like, this does not look like MDF or HDF. You're, this is actually it's pl plywood, yeah. plywood and birchwood, right? Yeah, it's birch plywood, yes, Japanese birch. I mean, this is like furniture level. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because it's uh, that's where they decide, that's where they chose the material. Um, our designers went to uh, the to uh, Tokyo Furniture um, Show, mm -hmm. um, and they went around looking for the specifically to look for the material they wanted to build these speakers out of. And they went around and they wrapped their knuckles on every table in every display throughout the whole show. And then they found that the birch was the sound that they wanted. You know, that was the, the tone that they were looking for. And of course we had it made up, um, you know, to our specification. Yeah, there's a lot of layers here. Yeah, yeah. and they're, they're biased, you know, once, one layer is that way, one layer is that way, you know, oh, okay. back and forth, so, yeah, so, so the strength. Yeah. The miter cutting is, you know, we've been doing woodworking For since, uh, yeah, from the yeah. 1800s, so we know how to deal with wood. One thing, I don't know if you can notice, Gene, but you see how thick the black yeah. coating is? This is the same piano fish um, finish that we use on our grand pianos. Nice. This is a Yamaha process. Um, it's a seven stage process of paint, buff, primer, buff, um, and this adds to the sound, it affects the sound of the speaker. So as, uh, you know, the sound is rolling off the baffle on the front, mm -hmm. uh, the material that this is made of. So this is all part of, if you decide you didn't like piano black and just sanded it all off, it wouldn't sound the same. Yeah. It would sound completely No, different. we've seen yeah. very high-end speakers use different materials on the front baffle, and it does. It changes the sonic signature of the, of the speaker, the way it just, the, the sound kind of branches out or bounces mm -hmm. off the front yeah. baffle. It really does make a difference. You're basically, when you're looking at a product like this, you're buying a piece of furniture that sounds good. That's really what it yeah. is. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So i got to tie it back to the dynamics. Yes. <laughs> so we talked about all the elements. You talked about the xylon. You talked about the uh, way to uh, to control the uh, resonance in, or the acoustic resonance inside the cabinet. Um, so everything is neutral, and when a snare yeah. drum rim shot happens or hits, everything is ready to go. So here's our um, crossover. Uh, it's very sophisticated, very wow. elaborate. Uh, Mundorf capacitors, those are some of the best ones. Uh, and this is just part of the crossover. I love this because it looks like a transformer from an AVR, but it's actually the inductor coil for the woofer. For the woofer, yeah. 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 It wouldn't fit on the board, or I mean, it's too heavy to fit on yeah. the board, so we... Well, it's good because it you're separating the magnetic coupling by putting it on its own. Yeah, and you anyway. see everything is 90 degrees to each other, yeah. so anything that could affect each other. Uh, everything has been uh, laid out at 90 degrees, so there's... And you put the high power resistors on standoffs for better thermal. I mean, there's just a lot of details yeah. into this. If you like, you know, it's a thick board. It's thick, uh, yep. thick copper on there, too. Very cool. So the last thing we'll talk about with these speakers is um, they are rear ported. I know you don't see a port in the front. I, I kind of like when you can do a rear port on a speaker as long as you can get it a few inches or a few feet away from yeah. the wall. You get more modal uh, balance and you get like more modal density by having that back wave of the, of the port resonating separate from the woofer. I just yeah. feel like sometimes it loads into the room a little bit differently than if a speaker Yeah, it's, it's a, a different sound. Port. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So the speakers, now these are pretty low to the ground, so you have to have them on stands. The stands come with the speaker, Yeah, the right? stands come with the speaker and the stands are not just uh, a cosmetic treatment on it. If you look at the front of the stands, they kind of have a, a horn shape to the legs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was all, that's all done with mathematics. And so when the woofer tends, you know, will start to couple with the floor, you know, that's as close as surface. The way the stand is designed, it will absorb that coupling uh, oh, okay. to the floor. So you're getting more of the pure sound from the woofer and not, you know, the, the muddled coupling from the walls and the or the floor specifically in, right, the, in this case you. right here. So it comes as a set. So the, the speakers and the stands. They come together? They come together, okay. yeah. So the price on the speakers is 15 grand a pair, right? 15,000 a and pair. And they yeah. only come in, in gloss black. Yep, okay. correct. Well guys, you heard it from Phil. He gave us some knowledge. I appreciate you dropping that knowledge. We listen to these speakers extensively. We're gonna be doing some more listening now that we have the turntable set up. And right now I'm just telling you, it's a very balanced speaker. The bass has good punch to it. 
There's a nice bite to the treble, but it's not bright. And the mid-range, the articulation of the mid-range is great. And in this room, which is not the greatest room, we still had a very strong phantom center. We had a good phantom image. And I basically, all I did was I set the speakers up with a little toe in. I didn't use a laser pointer. I didn't go crazy. <laughs> and it just, the speakers image really well. I yeah. mean, they, they, they didn't fuss too much about the placement. Once I just dialed it in a little bit. They do. Why don't you, if you spend a little time with them, there's a sweet spot, you know, with any speaker. If yeah. you get to that sweet spot, then it's just, psh, it just explodes into three-dimensional sound. So it's now, would you say that these speakers live up to the reputation and they earn the replacement to the NS1000s? I would say so. We've awesome. had 45 years of uh, practice, and if we can't improve something in 45 years, we're probably in the wrong business. So, guys, if you're on eBay and you're looking at buying a pair of NS1000s at above retail, maybe consider getting the NS5000s. Get the more modern technology now because these speakers, let me tell you, if you like the NS1000s, you're going to love these. They have the same kind of look and have all the updated technology in them. And actually, they're almost the same price. $1976 versus $2023. Mm -hmm. um, these are, are actually a little bit cheaper than what the uh, NS1000Ms would have been. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so these are a value. Excellent. Well, Phil, thanks again for dropping in all. Guys, if you like this video, please hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.